Good morning, comrades, and welcome to Sunday morning at the Virtual Marxist Library. My name is Eugene Rule, and I'm one of the small group of volunteers that uh, organize our programs and actually put it on. Um, and most of us are located near the library in Oakland or in Berkeley or Antioch, as the as case may be. Um, my job is to do the mailings and make the coffee, but since we are virtual, you're going to have to provide your own coffee. And while you're doing that and getting settled, I want to give you a little background on our library and our institute. The Nebel Proctor Marxist Library was named in memory of two remarkable individuals, Carl Nebel and Roscoe Proctor. Their book collections form the core of what became the Nebel Proctor Marxist Library for Social Research. Carl Nebel was a noted Marxist economist and scholar who came to the United States in 1934 after escaping uh, from Nazi Germany. He served in the New Deal and the US Navy in World War II. He survived the anti-communist hysteria of the McCarthy period and taught at Temple University and elsewhere before ending as a full professor at San Diego State University in the early 1970s. When Nebel, Proctor, uh, Nebel passed away in 1985, he asked that his extensive collection of books, pamphlets, and papers be made available to the uh, public and that his collection be named after his wife, Elizabeth Hale Nebel who was a teacher uh, and a leader in public housing during the um, New Deal. Roscoe Proctor was born in Texas and moved to California in the 1940s. He had a long career as a farm laborer, longshoreman with the ILWU, and community organizer in organizing youth here in Berkeley and Oakland. And they moved uh, in 1987 to Berkeley's historic Finn Hall, and then moved to its present location uh, at 6501 Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley. Uh, unfortunately, you can't visit that right now during the um, pandemic, and we no longer accept book uh, donations. Uh, we're pretty full. Anyway, since our founding, um, oh, about the same time uh, that all this was happening, the Institute uh, for the Critical Study of Society at the Nebel Proctor Marxist Library, or ICSS Marx, was formed to further the library's goals of preserving our written heritage, as well as supporting emerging struggles for racial and gender equality and for socialism. Members of ICSS are active in different aspects of people's struggles in the Bay Area and globally. Some of us are affiliated with specific political parties and tendencies, others are not. We respect one another, but we do not necessarily agree on all issues. Accordingly, the opinions expressed in our lectures, workshops, and publications are those of the authors only and do not represent any kind of group consensus on the issues discussed. We are united, however, in our respect for the work of Karl Marx and our belief that his work will remain as important for the class struggles of the future as they have been for the past. And as a group, we continue to draw inspiration from the work of Karl Marx, especially his 11th thesis on Feuerbach that the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. And I think uh, our speaker today, our um, session will be led by our comrade Raj Sahai, who is, uh, has been active not only in politics here in the United States, but also in India. And he exemplifies our commitment here this. So with that, I will turn it over to Raj to carry on the program further. And I Thank you, Gene. Uh, our moderator is Alan, and this we have 
Alan and I have put this together, although on the program of the a movement for uh, People's Party, move, movement for the People's Party, uh, I have uh, put those uh, slides together, which I'll be showing you. But Alan has put together, before we do that, Alan has uh, put together a couple of videos. And, but before that, I wanted to sort of just briefly mention the founder uh, or organizer of the Movement for People's Party is Nick Branagh. He's a young man who worked for uh, Bernie Sanders campaign in 2016 election. And in 2017, he started to think uh, after Bernie was pushed, elbowed out by DNC to begin to think about a different party. And, and so from 17 onwards, he's been working on it. And in this year, there has been a convention which, was, which happened in August. And uh, that uh, convention was for not yet of People's Party, but movement for a People's Party. So it's a pre-party formation. But within three days, over 100,000 people joined this party. So clearly, uh, there is enthusiasm for it. Uh, how far it will go, that will be the subject of our discussion today. Uh, with that, uh, and, it, and it has personalities, uh, some of the well-known personalities uh, on television are part of it. And, and, and some of the people associated with the, with the democratic politics uh, Ma Marion Williamson, for example, who was in the debates, is part of it, uh, aside from Chris Hedges and uh, the philosopher Cornell West, as well as uh, uh, you will see Jimmy Dore. So with that, uh, Alan, uh, shall we start the first video? Yeah, why don't you get started? You have it up, I believe, right? Yes, I, I will share. start that. I will start Do with the, Jimmy Dore. Jimmy Dore. There you go. Oh, okay. The previous owners of the sacred land that we're on, Goldman Sachs, of course. You know, in November, Americans are going to decide if they're going to vote for a right-wing racist pathological liar or Donald Trump. I don't know if you saw the Democrat convention. Uh, apparently, Joe Biden's health care plan won't cover your cancer treatment, but it does cover facelifts and hair plugs. The Republican convention was a bunch of rich guys telling you how scary socialism is to them. Ratings were down for both conventions. Americans are so ungrateful. Democrats and Republicans work hard to give us the worst candidates imaginable. The least we could do is watch their freak show conventions. You know all of us here. They're going to call all of us crazy just because we want a better future. They tell themselves that we are crazy because they are in denial about how crazy things have actually gotten. The system has failed. The system has collapsed. We are in an economic crisis. We're in a climate crisis. We're in a healthcare crisis. The current failed system has a noose around all of our necks. And we need to save ourselves. In America, we've got one party of oligarchy, one party of inequality. We have one party of war. The Republicans, incoherent, dangerous. Their candidate, a reality TV game show host, able to rise to power because of a failed system that left people desperate. They are not a solution. The Democrats, with their self-righteousness, their repulsive combination of class privilege and moral posturing, pretending to be the party of working people while selling them out to the predators of working people and the middle class. Joe Biden has gone his whole life demonizing the poor, decimating the social safety net, supporting unspeakable foreign policy. He's a tottering relic. And you know the glaze in Joe Biden's eyes? That's not from some spiritual awakening. That's from a 
persistent yearning for pajamas and gun smoke reruns. <laughs> a man who has cravenly created misery at home and abroad is now propped up as Uncle Joe, an erstwhile George Bailey, when in reality, he's Mr. Potter. And Donna Reed never kept people in prison so the state could use their free labor. Their candidate is the candidate of deregulation, the candidate, candidate of mass incarceration, and the candidate of war. They are not a solution. The establishment wants to go back. They want voters to go back to sleep, to trade one nightmare for another nightmare. At a moment when the status quo has so clearly failed us, we have candidates that promise nothing will fundamentally change. We need alternatives. We need alternative media. We need alternative energy. And we need alternative politics. But you need, you'll be going up against the big political parties. Big banks, big oil, big pharma. Let's get away from big. Let's realize that we are only big when we come together and acknowledge our smallness, stand in solidarity with each other. That's when we're big. We are up against Democrats and Republicans. We only care, Republicans and Democrats only care about short-term profits and short-term solutions. Democrats and Republicans are gonna give us a short-term future. A People's Party is the only solution. The People's Party must transform our political system, it must. The People's Party must rejuvenate our democracy that has already been stolen from us. For workers, we need to do this. For the planet, we need to do this. For all people, we need to do this. What the People's Party is proposing is something completely radical. We are demanding policies that the majority of Americans want. How radical. Things like single payer health care, actually regulating Wall Street, and stop killing black and brown people here and across the globe. And take that money we used to use to kill black and brown people in other countries and invest it back here at home in building a green infrastructure, making lives actually better instead of exporting misery. But independents and progressives no longer have to settle for less, except for scheduling meeting times agreeable to both members, which already sounds like a deal breaker. <laughs> we must work to become a majority party. And until we get there, we must be large enough that any party that wants to win must form a coalition with us. Coalition by which they concede to our demands and not the other way around. A compromise is not a compromise if it's you who's making all the concessions. They are going to concede to the majority of Americans and the policies we want, or they <coughs> are going to <coughs> Out of control inequality, poverty, corruption, we say no more, no more, no more. We wish to abolish the billionaire, not just to free ourselves, but to save the billionaire's soul as well. Every day we're told we are prisoners of a two-party system. We are not. We do not have to comfort our jailers and we can free ourselves from this prison. All this time, in our own hands. We've had the key of democracy to get us out. And when we free ourselves, we free our fellow citizens. We need to have the courage to fight for the world we want. No matter what we're up against or how long it takes. We think we're on the precipice of a dark abyss. We are not. When we bring on the sunrise, we will see we are on the cusp of a beautiful new world. This movement must win. Millions of working people are counting on us. 
The future of the nation is counting on us. The future of the human species is counting on us. People's part. Okay. So we're going to go next to uh, uh, Chris Hedges, who speaks for about 10 minutes for this same convention. So this first was Jimmy Dore. He, by the way, is son of a working class man in Chicago. Raj, can you maximize your window and open your chat? Thanks, Nick. Yeah. Uh, and thanks for uh, uh, letting me speak with such impressive people, some of whom I know and uh, most of whom I know about. Turn up your volume. Um, volume is, is maximized for as I know. Okay. Oligarchic power under Donald yeah, Trump, or the consolidation of oligarchic power under Joe Biden. Oh, sorry. An oligarch with Trump or Biden will win again, and we will lose. The oligarchs made it abundantly clear: should Bernie Sanders have miraculously become the Democratic Party nominee, they would join forces with the Republicans to crush him. The oligarchs preach the mantra of the least worst to us when they attempt to ram a Hillary Clinton or a Joe Biden down our throats, but ignore it for themselves. They prefer Biden over Trump, but they can live with either. Only one thing matters to the oligarchs. It is not democracy. It is not truth. It is not the consent of the governed. It is not income inequality. It is not the surveillance state. It is not endless war. It is not jobs. It is not the climate breakdown. It is the primacy of corporate power, which has extinguished our democracy and left most of the working class and the working poor in misery, as well as the continued increase and consolidation of their wealth. It is impossible to work within the system to shatter the hegemony of oligarchic power or institute meaningful reform. Change, real change, will only come by sustained acts of mass civil disobedience and mobilization, as with the Yellow Vest movement in France and the British-based Extinction Rebellion. The longer we are fooled by the electoral burlesque, the more disempowered we will become. Dr. Cornell West and I were on the streets with protesters in Philadelphia outside the appropriately named Wells Fargo Center during the 2016 Democratic Convention, when hundreds of courageous Sanders delegates walked out of the hall. Show me what democracy looks like, they chanted, holding Bernie signs above their heads as they poured out of the exits. This is what democracy looks like. Sanders' greatest tactical mistake was not joining them. He bowed in fear before the mighty altar of the corporate state. He had desperately tried to stave off a revolt by his supporters and delegates on the eve of the convention by sending out repeated messages in his name, most of them authored by members of the Clinton campaign, to be respectful, not disrupt the nominating process and support Clinton. Sanders was a dutiful sheepdog then and is a dutiful sheepdog now, attempting to herd his disgruntled supporters into the embrace of the Clinton and now Biden campaign. Sanders apparently believed that if he was obsequious enough, the Democratic Party elite, they would give him a chance in 2020, a chance they denied him in 2016. Politics, I suspect he would argue, is about compromise and the practical. And this is true. But playing politics in a system that is not democratic is about being complicit in the charade. Sanders misread the Democratic Party leadership swamp creatures of the corporate state. He misread the Democratic Party itself, which is a corporate mirage. Its base can, at best, select pre-approved candidates and act as props at rallies and in choreographed party conventions. The Democratic Party voters have zero influence on party politics or party policies. Sanders' naivete and perhaps his lack of political courage drove away many of his most committed young supporters. They are right, he is wrong. We need to overthrow the system, not placate it. Trump and Biden are each repugnant figures, doddering into old age with cognitive lapses and no moral core. Is Trump more dangerous than Biden? Yes. Is Trump more inept and more dishonest? Yes. Is Trump more of a threat to the open society? Yes. 
But is Biden the solution? No. Biden represents the nostalgia of the ruling elite for the old neoliberal order. He personifies the betrayal by the Democratic Party of working men and women that sparked the deep hatred of the ruling elites across the political spectrum. He is a gift to demagogues and con artists like Trump. A Biden presidency will ensure that far more competent demagogues will rise to take power. Biden cannot plausibly offer change. He can only offer more of the same. Most Americans do not want more of the same. The country's largest voting bloc, the 100 million plus citizens, who out of apathy or disgust do not vote, will once again stay home. This demoralization of the electorate, electorate is by design. In America, you were only allowed to vote against what you hate. But by voting for Biden, you do vote for something. You vote for the humiliation of courageous women, such as Anita Hill, who confronted their abusers. You vote for the architects of the endless wars in the Middle East. You vote for the apartheid state in Israel. You vote for wholesale surveillance of the public by government intelligence agencies and the abolition of due process and habeas corpus. You vote for austerity programs, including the destruction of welfare and cuts to social security. You vote for NAFTA, free trade deals, deindustrialization, a decline in wages, the loss of hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs and the offshoring of jobs to underpaid workers who toil in sweatshops in Mexico, China, or Vietnam. You vote for the assault on public education and the transfer of federal funds to for-profit and Christian charter schools. You vote for the doubling of our prison population, the tripling and quadrupling of sentences, and huge expansion of crimes meriting the death penalty. You vote for militarized police who gun down poor people of color with impunity. You vote against the Green New Deal and immigration reform. You vote for limiting a woman's right to abortion and reproductive rights. You vote for a segregated public school system in which the wealthy receive educational opportunities and poor people are denied a chance. You vote for punitive levels of student debt and the inability to free yourself of debt obligations through bankruptcy. You vote for deregulating the banking industry and the abolition of Glass-Steagall. You vote for the for-profit insurance and pharmaceutical corporations and against universal health care. You vote for bloated defense bu budgets. You vote for the use of unlimited oligarchic and corporate money to buy our elections. You vote for a politician who during his time in the Senate abjectly serves the interests of MBNA, the largest independent credit card company headquartered in Delaware, which also employed Biden's son, Hunter. What the public wants and deserves will again be ignored for what the corporate lobbyists demand if we do not respond to the social and economic catastrophe yes. that has been visited on most of the population, mm -hmm. exacerbated by our failure to control the pandemic. We will be unable to thwart the rise okay. of corporate tyranny and a Christian okay. fascism okay. or halt the ecocide that will wipe out the human species along with most other life forms. Right-wing violence, along with lethal police violence, will explode with or without Trump in office if we do not build robust socialist programs to reintegrate those who've been pushed aside back into society, to heal the ruptured social bonds, to give workers jobs that provide a sustainable income and dignity, empowerment and protection, to provide free and well-funded schooling through college. If we do not rebuild our labor unions along with institutions We need to stand up for our values, not surrender them, which is why I urge you in this election to vote for the Green Party. I am not willing to surrender every issue I care about to become an accomplice in this moral squalor and death march to extinction. But I'm also not naive enough to tell you we can win. The corporate state has built very effective mechanisms of control and oppression. Hello? But these corporate forces have us by the throat, and they have Hello? my children by the throat. In the end, I do not fight fascists because I will win. I Hello? fight fascists 
because they are fascists. Thank you. I would go over uh, what I did was uh, the platform is quite large and I actually made it uh, condensed it, keeping all the content. Uh, so I'll just go over that. It'll take me about 20 minutes. I will not go over every point. Uh, there are 13 points there, and then there are sub points, which I also have number one, two, three, four, and so forth. But the major points are also number one, two, three, four. So I'll start with the f beginning, which is that an economic bill of rights. So they have two points there. The first one is against three evils, militarism, racism, and economic justice. So economic injustice. So these are the three uh, things that they consider uh, uh, they, they are fighting for. So they want a revolution of moral values in America. So uh, that's one. Uh, the other one is that they seek elimination of poverty, etc. I'll skip that. That goes along. Uh, so the second major point is they want strong unions and workplace democracy. And there are three points in it. So they are for working people, but the three points are interesting. They seek to democratize the workplace by encouraging the creation of worker cooperatives. Uh, some of you might be following Richard Wolf. He He's the big proponent of workers' cooperatives as a way to slide into, uh, convert to socialism. Now, you know, Lenin wrote about that and there is a problem with that. Within the capitalist system, the cooperatives cannot rise up to that. That's the problem. The second point is they seek worker participation in management of the corporation. And this is not taking over of the, of the corporation. So this is like a worker a management uh, which is actually uh, an interesting idea. This was actually an idea of uh, strengthening capitalism. And I don't know what it is, but it is some kind of uh, a strange idea. I, I think it's very anti-socialist idea here. Uh, the third one is they advocate worker cooperatives to build unions directly into the fabric of the corporation. Now, I don't know what they mean by it, uh, but this again, trying to integrate private corporation and workers union is, is, is kind of like what fascists, fa I'm not saying these, are, these people are not fascist, but, but that was their idea, you know, men uniting the working class with the corporation. Of course, corporation dominating, the ruling class dominating. These people are not about that, but so at, at best, I would say these ideas are really uh, ideas that are half-baked and they don't understand the class relationship. So that will be my strong criticism of their platform, although their intent is good. The third one is modernizing the infrastructure. And now they're on to other things to do, when they have the power, what to do. Modernizing their infrastructure and creating good paying jobs. Or if they are a big enough party, they can influence this, you know, even if they are not in power, as Jimmy Dore said. And I've just picked three points from there. One of them is repairing the aging, you know, infrastructure, water pipes, meters, waste pump, water treatment, blind, plants, expanding bus, subway, high-speed rail, uh, public transportation, reducing car use, and then internet as a public utility, high-speed community broadband that covers every place, including rural communities, okay? So that's, uh, so that's your three points, first three points. The fourth one is uh, reform the tax system, fair tax code and modernizing small business. So I'll just pick three points from there. They want to restore high taxes on corporations and the wealthy, but they also list it should be less than 90% Roosevelt's USA. For Roosevelt, the highest income tax in Roosevelt's time was 94%. If you had an income of $25,000, no matter from where, above that, 94% would be taxed, 
he had actually proposed 100%, but the Republicans cried foul and he settled for 94%. The second point is increase the inheritance tax and introduce a wealth tax for multimillionaires. But they don't give any numbers. I suppose that is to be debated in the party. Uh, third one is raised. So there's a wealth tax means, you know, redistribution of wealth, basically. Third one is raise the capital gains tax on billionaires above those paid by nurses and truck drivers. We know that's what's happening, but they don't describe how or how, what is the numbers. And they're talking about uh, uh, closing tax loopholes and other things, offshore tax havens and so forth. The fifth point of their platform, fifth major point is to rein in Wall Street, as they say, and create public banks. You know, this public banking system is a big thing for them. The first thing is revive Glass-Steagall and break up the big banks. And my comment on that is that this is anti-financial monopoly, and therefore, in a sense, anti-imperialist step. Because Glass-Steagall was within system of capitalism and imperialism, but their movement is against neoliberalism, so at least against neoliberalism. It's not necessarily anti-imperialism, but against neoliberalism. The other point I'll pick up to point out here, there are 11, 12 points. I don't want to read all 12 points. We can go back to that when we go into the discussion. The so other major point here is break up monopolies, enforce antitrust laws, and reverse the consolidation of business, which has been going on. All the small businesses are being forced to sell to the bigger business and the big business are coalescing. So making giant corporation. Uh, another point is make Federal Reserve operate as a public bank for the people of the USA. You know, Federal Reserve Bank is a bank of private bankers. You know, it is regulated and it's controlled by the government uh, to some extent and uh, there are laws and the, the Federal Reserve Bank chair is appointed, but basically the Federal Reserve, I mean, the government itself is owned by the ruling class, which is the capitalist class, so that doesn't change. But they want to make it as a public bank for the people of the USA, very radical. Another point I want to highlight is a set of public banks and postal banking. So not only Federal Reserve, but you know, public banks uh, like they have in the state of North Dakota. Uh, so they want to have each state have their own public banks and that serve the public, a small business and, and uh, working people. Uh, so this is sort of anti-capitalist thinking, although we, this is within capitalism. They don't actually, uh, they want reform of capitalism is what they want. So the sixth point is on trading and they want fair trade. Uh, reverse trade packs like NAFTA, CAFTA, PNTR with China, and the idea is to recover job losses uh, and improve wages, job losses that occurred by when the jobs were shifted to China, you know, industrial jobs. And then they lowered the wages for everybody because there are too many people looking for those, uh, for any job remaining, so they lowered the wages. Uh, the second point is to renegotiate treaties that do not permit, uh, that do not allow, sorry, that do not allow, uh, do not, uh, uh, basically that treaties that make US government uh, unable to, uh, uh, US government is under the corporate tribunals. And since the US government, according to Lenin's thesis, capitalist society, the government is, is the, actually is the executive committee of the ruling class, which is the capitalist class. So they are themselves, corporations don't want it because the public, public has some pressure on the government. So this is, uh, they're look, seeking national sovereignty by doing that and trying to get working people to have some power. The third one is incentives to companies to keep good paying jobs in the US. So again, somehow boost the national economy. That's their intent, okay? So I'll go to the next one. Why is it not moving? Okay. Why is it stuck? 
Okay. All right. So the next one is uh, fourth point, major point is fair tax code and modernizing small business. And that's restore high taxes on corporation on, uh, and the wealthy, but less than 90. I thought I, we covered in the first one. Increase the inheritance tax. I think I mentioned this already, right? So I'll move to fifth point. Okay, after fifth, I went to fourth. Okay, okay, sorry about that. Okay, the seventh point. Defend and uphold direct democracy. This is very interesting. They want direct democracy. So I just highlight three points here. Abolish corruption, restore democracy, ban super PACs, dark money, shut down, non-transparent, Transparent, uh, um, let me move this thing, non-transparent outside spending. So our, our system is very corrupt in, in, in you know, democracy, very much manipulated, Chris Hedges has already mentioned. Uh, another point here is corporations as people to be outlawed and, and money is not free speech. And these two things the capitalist class has put in here now uh, as you know, and Democrats pretend to fight it, but actually both parties are happy with it. Um, empower Americans to bypass Congress and enact uh, laws directly, so direct democracy. Now this is very interesting. Direct democracy is a, is, is a concept there. So whether it's workable or not, I don't know, but that's a pretty radical suggestion they have. So, uh, uh, and through direct democracy, people can vote according to them on uh, uh, broad policy like free public college over high tuition. So they don't want even want the politicians to enact or uh, vote on it. They don't have any trust on that. They say, just go direct democracy. And then the single player healthcare over employer-based insurance. So they think that if public is allowed to do that, direct democracy, and all this. So basically their idea is, their goal is politicians cease to be decision makers, become glorified administrators of public's preferences. This is almost like communism, except is the contradiction is you still have corporations. So it's highly, uh, their platform is highly conflicted. I mean, they don't have an understanding of the class system under which, again, this is not moving, what way? Uh, next one is secure uh, 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 transparent uh, transparent election, okay? And in this, what they're saying is ranked choice voting, okay? Multi-member districts, automatic voter registration, open primaries, make election day a national holiday, early voting by mail, eliminate electoral college, abolish gerrymandering, independent commissions to draw districts to favor competitiveness. So that's, and the other thing they're saying here is, uh, once again, uh, public finance of election, basically stop, ban lobbies from making contribution. The other one is eliminate all lobbyist loopholes and restore fairness doctrine and equal time rule in media coverage. Also, they want election for president uh, be run by independent commissions rather than the two-party managed thing that they're doing right and they're keeping, keeping competitive candidates from other parties out like the Green Party, they, they were kept out and so forth. So that's another of their reform. Uh, so that's uh, on number eight we have done. And so I'm gonna go to number nine. The number nine is uh, Defend civil liberties, okay? In that they're saying end mass surveillance, strengthen freedom of speech and thought, the fabric of a free society, restore right to privacy and the fourth amendment, defend the habeas corpus, protect the freedom of information act. And then they bring in ban assault rifles. For some reason they think this, this is to do with civil liberties, ban assault rifles armor piercing rounds, bump stocks, and high capacity magazines. So those points are in, in this number nine slide. And number 10 is the racial, um, 
women, gender preferences, and indigenous rights. So this is their 10th point in their platform. And what they're saying here is uh, racial justice and purging of minority voting roles, demilitarize our police forces, limit use of force, eliminate mandatory minimum sentencing. And similarly, for equal rights for women, expand social security benefits, increase cost of living adjustment, keep up with the rising medical. That's for all, but it, you know, they think that's particularly, it, it, it is part of women's equality. Uh, provide 12 weeks of paid family medical leave, minimum wage 15 hours and so forth. Then LGBTQIA equality. Uh, that, that is also similar and uh, discrimination and oppression based on sexual orientation. And the fourth one is indigenous rights and injustices perpetrated against indigenous people, recognize their rights and so forth. So that's another, another point of their platform. Um, so I'll, I'll move to the next slide, which is 11, number 11. Uh, 11 is here. Okay. Okay. The, the, this one is a, towards a peaceful global community benefiting from technology. There's a lot of emphasis on technology. So number one is end wars of aggression, preemptive wars and regime change. They want that ended. Close Guantanamo prison and return it to Cuba and prosecute all the people involved in all this kind of stuff who have violated uh, Geneva Convention. Number two is lead the international community in addressing climate change. That's part of their uh, global community participation in technology. And then they said they uh, used a trillion dollar located in nuclear weapons instead to uh, fund preschools, school and free public college across America. So they want the trillion dollars that they were, both parties have allocated, uh, Democrats and Republicans combined uh, to move to this use. Uh, the, another point is pursue diplomatic solutions with North Korea and Iran and halt efforts to destabilize Venezuela. De-escalate tensions, proxy wars with Russia and resume bilateral nuclear stockpile reduction, etc. Another point is they, they think that by just spending $175 billion a year, which is a quarter of the annual US defense budget will end extreme poverty throughout the whole world. And they think that this, by doing that, we become moral leaders and actual leaders in the world towards a more global community living harmoniously. Um, and then they want to strengthen the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So this is their point number 11. Twelfth one is uh, in the platform is promise and perils of accelerating technology. So they both see both promises and peril. And the point one is in the next few decades, they believe machine labor will largely replace human labor. Now, as you know, as Marxists, we know that's the crisis of capitalism. Uh, automation for individual capitalists, for individual nations where the capitalism is strong, they keep on adding machinery and replacing labor, but labor is the only one that produces the surplus value. So they're undercutting their own ability to make profit. So then they go out and plunder some other place, some workers from another place and, and get. So their idea that machine labor will largely replace human labor, I think is, is a mistake. It will never do that. But it, I think the tendency of capitalism, that's what making capitalism go in crisis in my opinion. Uh, the second point is, uh, uh, if we don't do anything, if we don't democratize the access to technology, then the rich people will gain and exploit them and even trench their advantages over the rest of humanity further. So, it, so they are saying fight for technological progress, be guided democratically and distributed equitably. This is, they think is a very important point. The third point is uh, um, they think that uh, technology can be used to create abundance 
and uh, and but there are also perils that come with it uh, like uh, you know uh, they will talk about it is it's in the next one is nuclear weapons will be joined by a host of this is the peril uh, bio weapons nano weapons artificial intelligence weapons and so that's the peril um, so the economic and political system that we're living under will become threat multipliers with new technology, which we are already seeing. Uh, and then the sixth point they have is, uh, we have technology, you know, which can meet every human need, they think. But it is, unless you harness it for democratically, it will it will serve the opposite purpose. So in, in the end, they say, this is our choice at this moment, paradise or oblivion. That's where we are headed. So they're very acutely aware of the technology's role. And the last point is about taking care of the veterans. They made it a major platform. And they said that we are from Vietnam. If soldiers who returned with PTSD were, uh, they, they didn't have honorable discharge because of PTSD and they didn't qualify for healthcare benefits. So they, all these veterans, those who didn't commit suicide became homeless. And there are presently more than a million American personnel who have been injured in the wars in, in, in the Middle East and elsewhere. So there's a lot of homelessness. So they want uh, to end that, you know, the decent housing. The other point they say is the decision to engage in military conflicts must consider all costs including not only the active military and the hardware of war, but also the lasting human cost, because that's what society pays, individuals pay. So that before you think of a war, think about that. I mean, they're asking about a ruling class that's not, that's not their concern. I mean, they just want to manage the people because <laughs> they're focused on their individual, on the class profit and individual profit of the ruling class uh, capitalists. And then they say, ensure all veterans facilities solely benefit veterans and their families. There are other points here. So that's all in all, this is their platform. I think I gave you um, uh, a bird's eye view of it. Uh, later on, Mehmet will place this on, uh, uh, on YouTube. So each of these slides would be visible. Um, as we are recording it, and we want to make sure that everybody can see every slide. And then, uh, right as we go into discussion, Alan, you have some thoughts to add here before? No, I've, I'm the moderator. I'll moderate. Okay. So with that, I think uh, we're ready to go into a break. Uh, with Gene, will make some announcements, and maybe Richard Fallenbaum would make some announcements, and then we can go into Shall I leave the slides in or shall I end this thing, Alan? Uh, you can leave them up in case people want to refer to them. Okay, very good. So thank you very much for your attention. We can go into, into uh, the discussion period and a break right now uh, for Gene to do his announcements and then maybe Richard uh, Fallenbaum about appeal for funds. Yes, <clears throat> I had asked for about 10 minutes because I've been long, have a long history of um, um, Gene, that, let's do that. Let's you, you be the okay, first one to I go to like the question and answer. I asked for that. And yeah, discussion period. Let's do that in the discussion period. Okay, we can. Yeah. Um, okay, well, uh, maybe Richard wants to put the information about. Um, yes, I will. I'll put it in the chat. Okay, um, I'll go ahead and um, say a word about finances. Um, we need finances, and, and I guess there's been a little bit of a slowdown in contributions lately, quite a slowdown. Um, I wanna urge people to uh, make a contribution. It's quite easy, You can, especially if you have um, um, PayPal, you just uh, click on the, click on it, and you can send it to to, to us. And um, you have to 
you don't have to write a check or anything like that. And we'll soon have another for, uh, payment format that's also easy. But in the meantime, even a $5 contribution, $10 contribution would be good. Um, but I suggest people give a substantial one and, you know, um, that would last a month or two. I think people have, some people have made contributions at the beginning, six or seven months ago, or five or six months ago. And I think we need to, you know, I think that I'd like to urge them to um, uh, consider another contribution now. But thank you for everybody who, uh, who has made a contribution and those who are going to in the future. <clears throat> okay, I'm, okay. I'm coming. Yeah, let me, uh, I'm, I'm going to be, I'll be moderating this section of it. Let me just say, Raj, I think it might be better for you to turn off the slide share. Okay. Okay. Do you want the upcoming should, program? Look at, okay. I'm sorry. Do you and want then, upcoming uh, programs? Oh, okay. Go ahead, Gene. Yeah. You know, because we have three, well, we have a number of things coming up, excellent programs. September 27th, labor and immigration. We're very fortunate in having David. Uh, uh, David. Thank you. David Bacon, yes, I didn't put it. So uh, he will be speaking on the next week on the 27th. Uh, and that's on our webpage. Uh, after that, um, we have uh, the crisis in education, capitalist mess and socialist solutions. And that'll be led by our comrade Gerald Smith, who has people from uh, the Oakland School District uh, elections and so forth, talking about what's going on in uh, Oakland schools and how this is impacted by this whole neoliberalist uh, nonsense that's going on. And then uh, on November, October 11th, we have our good friend and comrade um, um, Larry Shoup of the Green Party um, and longtime member of ICSS will be talking about dealing with COVID-19, a comparison between Cuba and the United States. And he has uh, a lot of knowledge on that. And then we have some, uh, we're still working on the future schedule, but check out our website, icssmarks.org. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do now is move to the uh, uh, discussion part of uh, today's program. And I think this is gonna be a little bit more open. It's not really a Q and A like we usually have. So I would encourage anybody who wants to spend some time presenting their view on um, the People's Party and um, anything related to it to go ahead. Jean, why don't you go ahead and start and um, I'll moderate. People want to uh, talk and present. You can raise your hand by clicking on the raise hand icon at the bottom by clicking at the participants window and um, uh, raise hand at the bottom. So why don't you uh, go ahead, Gene, and then the second would be Roger Harris and then Yusuf. So Gene, you wanna go ahead? Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, um, you know, my reaction to the two videotaped speakers we had, uh, Two, two things. First of all, it's just deja vu all over again. I've been hearing this uh, for 20 more years or longer. So uh, it's not anything new in that program, nothing the Green Party doesn't have and that the Peace and Freedom Party doesn't have much better. Uh, so that's point one. Point two is, you know, don't blame me for the mess. I voted for Barry Commoner back in 1980. I registered Peace and Freedom when I returned to California in 1970s, uh, worked for Barry Commoner. And it's, uh, if you take a look um, uh, at his program, it was, I think it was superior, but uh, that's not the issue here. So th th these things are not new. And um, there's a long history of third parties uh, trying to develop and failing. Um, also, I think it's very disingenuous of the People's Party people there to claim it comes out of the Bernie Sanders campaign 
when the Bernie Sanders, whole point of the Bernie Sanders campaign was we don't, you know, third party is a dead end. And he, uh, you know, pioneered the, um, the, 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 what our comrade Tom Gallagher calls the primary route. You know, we're stuck with the third party, two parties. It's not a good thing, but it's reality. We need to adjust to it. And if you look at what Bernie did, uh, running as uh, running in the Democratic Party, he got uh, more votes, not only more votes than any other pre socialist presidential candidate in history, but more than all of them combined. Uh, he got 13 million votes. So he did very well in 19, in 2016. In 2018, Bernie was joined by a number of others, the so-called squad. So he quadrupled or more the number of people. And then in the coming 2020 elections, I think it's going to increase even further. So again, um, I think we need to bear this in mind. And when we think about the coming elections, what's going on, we have to consider um, the other alternatives, specifically uh, the primary route. And I'll just, uh, more to say, but I'll just stop there. But I do want to say, uh, I'm going to be voting for uh, Gloria Lariva. Uh, she has, the Peace and Freedom Party is still has a better party platform than uh, the so-called People's Party. Um, and Gloria is the only one who is, uh, is not anti-communist. She is a, a communist herself. She's a Marxist-Leninist. She's been to China. She's been to North Korea. She's been to Cuba. She knows what she is talking about. And she's the only um, person who defends um, China, Cuba, and the other communist countries. So uh, that's just want to put that out. So I'll stop you, there. Alan, before... Okay, I like all right. Go, I'm I just want to... Yes, yeah, Ro Raj, I'm the moderator. Raj, I'm moderating. Yeah. I just okay, asked him next. if I can give some information before Roger goes. Go right ahead, Raj. I just want to say that I did reach, try to reach a People's Party, uh, a movement for People's Party to send somebody to speak. So I didn't get a response. I just wanted to let everybody know. Okay. That. Okay. All right. Sorry. So uh, next up is. Uh, Roger, I've unmuted you, then Yusuf, then Laura, then Richard Wright. Roger. Good morning. Uh, and I'm very glad to hear that the library had made an attempt to reach the People's Party because I think um, hearing, hearing the people, People's Party and the activists in there is really, really critical. Um, I, I would agree with Jean about the uh, uh, People's Party, um, the, the Peace and Freedom Party has a better platform than the People's Party. And um, it would be better to vote for the Peace and Freedom Party. But mainly I agree because um, the People's Party is not on the ballot. And so let's, let's get real. Um, the, the, it's a pre-party formation, it's a beginning. And I think we need to understand what it represents how we can unite with it where it's positive and how we can um, be and be part of a larger movement. Um, I think we received a, a very good um, analysis of why the existing platform of the People's Party is not a revolutionary communist platform. Um, I think, uh, and I think we could probably, most of us agree that it's not a revolutionary communist platform. Um, but I'll, and I have some sort of sharp criticisms now, and I hope it's understood that these criticisms are uh, political and not personal. Um, the, the question for Marxists is not to make a checklist and say, does this particular platform represent a communist platform? That's what we call checklist communism. It's a form of ultra-left idealism. What we need to understand about the People's Party is one, a large question, a larger question, and it's a question that all Marxists has to have to address, and that is the question of relationship between reform and revolution. 
Marx and his successors were very clear that we support reform as a step toward revolution. And it's only ultra leftism that rejects reform entirely and doesn't understand the difficult and very difficult way of formulating the understanding of how we take genuine um, mass demands and make them into a revolutionary program. Um, and it's not done by just simply saying that um, this is reformist and therefore not acceptable. Um, what we need to understand is the relationship of why the, the People's Party arose this time in the, in, in the development of the struggle, where they fit into the struggle. Um, and these, these are the, 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 the very clear questions we have to address. In addition, the People's Party is not a Marxist-Leninist formulation. It is a mass party. It is not only a mass party, but it is a multi-tendency party. And it takes a, a, a fairly adroit ability to understand how to address that. These, I think, are the questions that we need to address, not that they fail to come up with a revolutionary communist platform. And I'll be interested in the subsequent discussion. Thank you. Okay, next up is Yusuf. I'm going to uh, unmute you and uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, first of all, let me congratulate uh, Raj uh, uh, on 100 years of uh, uh, the communist movement in India, which I believe was uh, a few days ago. Uh, so uh, well, I, I tend to agree with many of the things that Eugene and Roger uh, um, have said. On the one hand, you have the two bourgeois parties, establishment parties, uh, 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 and, uh, and on one end, uh, Marxist-Lenin cadre parties. I won't discuss those. Uh, and in the middle, I think they, they, there are these... Um, uh, uh, formations like ESA uh, uh, and so on, uh, uh, they agree to a certain extent. Uh, I think uh, we, uh, what's wrong is um, uh, that uh, sector is becoming too crowded. Uh, and, uh, and perhaps the People's Party is uh, adding to the, uh, 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 to the crowd. I think the important thing uh, is not on the venue, but on um, uh, building a movement. And I think uh, whatever uh, uh, admittedly um, uh, Bernie Sanders has many shortcomings, but uh, 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 one should credit him with uh, uh, building a movement, uh, a, 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 a true uh, a social democratic uh, movement, which uh, uh, the uh, uh, Marxist uh, could, could uh, find a place. Uh, so uh, uh, I, 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 as for the Peace and Freedom uh, Party, I think that's a good concept. Um, uh, a, uh, but uh, unfortunately, I, I gather it's a, a California-based uh, party. Uh, um, I, I think that for, a, a, has a, a very uh, special place of its own, but uh, it seems to be a California-based party that's uh, the uh, problem with it. Uh, uh, these are uh, basically what I have to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next up is uh, Laura, if you would uh, unmute and uh, go ahead. Okay. The, um, what, what they've been saying, their approach, okay, let me say that they often are uh, complementary toward the Green Party, and I'm very much respectful, as everybody knows, of the Peace and Freedom Party and the Green Party, and I know that there are differences. 
Um, but the Green Party is a national party. And so, as Chris Hedges said, in this election, vote green, um, primarily because, as, as Yusuf just pointed out, because of the geography. Um, what, so, so they're trying not to um, irritate and actually trying to bring in uh, greens, apparently. Um, and their approach, what they say they want to do, is to run for a bunch of people for strategic con congressional races in 2022, so in two years. And then in four years, they want to run for president. Um, and one of the, so what they're trying to do, it seems to me, is not piss anybody off with their platform and with what, with what they're focusing on. So they're trying to be uh, careful with what they say. So while they say protect whistleblowers, which conceptually sounds great, um, they don't necessarily do as, a, as Orion would say, um, go focus on the Julian Assange case that's happening right now and the specific whistleblowers um, and while they say good things about uh, foreign policy, they're not going to line up. They're, they're not going to uh, and, and talk about the sanctions against Cuba, you know, the boycott blockade against Cuba and the, and the unilateral uh, coercive measures across the globe, including Venezuela. Uh, Sanders was never um, uh, he'd called Hugo Chavez a dead communist dictator, which I'll never forget. Um, but so they're trying, they think that by making their platform majoritarian, that then the voters will support it. And by not going too far, they think then the Democratic Party establishment will not fight them as much as they have with the Green Party. And probably as people in this know, what they are doing with the Green Party now is just working to keep us off the ballot through whatever, by whatever means necessary, and has kept the presidential ticket off the ballot in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. So they're going for to keeping the Green Party off. What, would, what will the Democratic Party establishment do with this watered down um, People's Party? The same thing. They don't want to, they don't want any competition. They will, um, they will do, fight in all of the ballot access ways, the being on the, uh, the presidential ballot, you know, on, on uh, uh, blaming, pe you know, People's Party as they've blamed the Green Party. Uh, they, in coalition, believe me, every um, presidential candidate from Nader on has tried to, to cut deals in a way with the uh, Democratic Party establishment, at least to say, hey, pick up these um, policies of ours that the people like, pick up these policies and the Democratic Party establishment will not do it. And so to me, that's, you know, they, they want to run for Congress in 2022. They want to run for presidency in 2024. They don't want to irritate the, the voters or the Democratic Party establishment. They somehow want to slide in with these things that people really want, but they are absolutely underestimating um, the Democratic Party or they're overestimating that the Democratic Party actually cares whatsoever about ordinary people. Over. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is um, Richard Wright, then Richard Fallenbaum, and then uh, Sharon Rose. So uh, Richard Wright, if you would um, un, you are unmuted. Go ahead. I've done that. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Um, so, um, so I've been to, I've participated in a number of these, uh, uh, what they call onboarding sessions. Uh, I think they have them every other Thursday night, if I recall correctly. Um, 
And by and large, I agree that they are certainly not a Marxist Leninist party. Uh, they, they, they're far from it. They're much more of a populist party. I see them in the same light as, as indivisible. Um, as a group of, of, uh, of ex-legislative people that got together and, and, uh, and uh, have decided to go their own way. Uh, I will say uh, that, that as far as their recruiting methods go, uh, they, they bear looking at because they're really putting, um, I think that they do have a good model as far as recruiting people to their cause. That's to say that they have periodic uh, you know, periodic sessions where they, where you, anybody can join. Uh, they just report what it is they're, what it is they're, they're doing, how you can, how you can uh, pitch in, et cetera. Um, uh, on the other hand, like I said, they basically, they're, I don't see them as being other than nice liberal Democrats. Uh, by and large, I think a lot of them are, aren't so much out of the Bernie Sanders campaign as it strikes me that a lot of them are mad at the DNC um, and and need to be looked at in that respect. Um, so I'll, with that, I'll shut up. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Uh, next up is uh, Richard Fallenbaum and then Sharon and then uh, Jean. So, uh, now, before Jean right. goes, let me have come there because uh, Jean has spoken. And so I want to come back to address some of the points because I made the presentation on it. So uh, it'd be better if I came before Jean, but it's okay. Either it could be after Jean also. Put me okay, on the so uh, Richard Fallenbaum, if you want to go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, first of all, I agree with the criticisms of the platform. Uh, you know, it's this laundry list of issues, and you know, that which is sort of put together by a committee. I think it functions more, less to uh, um, clarify than to obscure the, the basic issues. Um, a much shorter platform, more hard hitting, would be more um, uh, mobilizing. One thing I think is interesting about this People's Party thing is to, to a certain extent, it um, expresses a discontent with uh, Sanders, but, you know, Hedges, incidentally, Hedges and Dore Dor are much more radical than the platform. Um, um, go, go it's, a it's a discontent with um, Sanders and democratic socialism in general, and not necessarily from the right. Um, I think even though it, you know, doesn't quote, say, you know, socialism, in some respects, uh, at least the statements from Dorr and um, uh, Hedges were, were more radical than I, than I um, see in general political discourse. Um, uh, you know, it's an odd situation, you know, it's an odd situation. Uh, the most radical candidate in 2016 was Trump, and he may be the most radical candidate today. He, uh, he, he's, he's, he was for ending in endless wars. He was for normalizing relations with Russia, um, even with, you know, having a business-like relationship with China, whereas the... Um, you know, the rest of the two parties were um, um, uh, you know, very reactionary and still reactionary. And that, that's, a, you know, it's, uh, it's a paradoxical situation. You know, I, I, you know, we all talk about um, how the, the um, Republican Party is uh, leaning towards fascism. Well, you know, the Democratic Party is also a, a neo-fascist party. It's less obvious, but um, it's, it's a militarist, um, it's uh, uh, populist of demagogy, it um, exploits um, ethnic differences, um, 
and it's becoming more so in each direct in this direction as and um, so the idea of cooperating with the democratic party is um, is ridiculous it's it's a betrayal of the working class i think the democratic party even more than the republican party has to be exposed for what it is it's not a it's not a watered down version of a of a people's party it's it's a it's a reactionary a uh, very dangerous party in my view so that's all i want to say okay thank you next up is uh sharon and uh then followed by raj and then jean so sharon why don't you go ahead well i'm going to speak in favor of uniting with the democratic party so i think that whatever trump represented last time is not the same as what he represents now what he represents now is a fascist tendency in this country and a whipping up of racist hatred and xenophobia, especially against China. And um, I like to def I'd like to stand up and defend the concept, the revolutionary concept of a united front. We need a united front against this fascist tendency. And with, what does a united front mean? It means that you unite everyone who can possibly be united against uh, the main danger. As soon as you defeat that main danger, you don't have to continue. Uh, that we don't advocate uh, forever unity. The united front is a particular tactical well, I think it's strategic. It's a strategic thing for a particular time. The American people need to get rid, need to defeat this fascist tendency that is growing in our country, that is being whipped up by, by Trump and, and his, um, his part of the Republican Party, which is the dominant part. And I think that communists need to go back and look at the, the strategic concept of United Front. It's a communist, it's a Marxist principle. Thank you. Okay, um, next up is uh, Raj. Why don't you go ahead, followed by uh, Jean and then Youssef. Okay. Uh, first of all, I the, the presenting their platform is not promoting their platform. Okay, I've just this is for our discussion, uh, and the critique I was making as I read their platform items, I found it Roger's comment curious, like checklist checklist communism he called it or something like that. Uh, <laughs> I didn't understand that, but the point is I'm showing they're conflicted I I between their goals and their means to get to the goal. The goals are, I think, they're Rooseveltian goals. They want a Roosevelt type of reform of 1930s, uh, radical reform of capitalism, basically. It cannot get there in, in my judgment at this stage of capital. It could do it then. So they're fundamentally off. But they're coming from, one thing is that they're to the left of Bernie Sanders. So they were with Bernie Sanders. That, these are disgruntled people who think Bernie Sanders made ultimately a compromise, which should not have made. And so therefore, without condemning Bernie Sanders, these people are saying, we'll form it. So basically, uh, Roger's idea was, and I think many people think the Democratic Party needs to break up. I think this is the beginning of the breakup. But they are not radical even to the extent of existing communist parties, obviously, certainly not, and not Green Party, which is also uh, some kind of green uh, and red combination, you know. Uh, so uh, each, each party will defend themselves uh, to, on the left as Marxist or something, uh, something like Marxist party. Certainly Marxist Leninist party, there doesn't exist one in the United States. When Roger says this is not Marxist Leninist, yeah, not even not even any no party is Marxist Leninist. They are Marxist Leninist individuals, so we should understand that. 
Uh, I was just pointing out the conflict they have with their own goals and Marx's analysis of where we are in, in a decay of capitalism, it is impossible. What they're saying is impossible. But the fact is, it will probably lead to break up, potentially break up of the Democratic Party after this election, particularly if, if a Democratic Party loses the presidential election. I think there is a good chance that it'll break up. So that helps in that regard. And they have 100,000 people signed up. I mean, they, I've got to respect that. Uh, I don't know, other than two parties, uh, how many people are signed up as members of any of the other parties. Maybe Green Party probably is the largest, next largest. Uh, the other thing is, uh, uh, as Richard Wright said, they're nice liberal. Actually, they're radical liberals. I would say they're quite radical. And we look at their program. Quite, I would consider them a radical liberal, not just liberal. And uh, uh, I don't think uh, the laundry list, yeah, okay, Richard's saying laundry list is actually obscures the basic, basic issues. Um, I think the very basic contradiction is they think that, which is actually Chris Hedges also uses the term, a corporation versus capitalism. They think that capitalism is possible without this giant monopoly. We're in a monopoly stage of capital. You know, you either have to overthrow it or you have to live with it. So they are, they are not, they're not Marxist. They don't understand it. So obviously they're not gonna go far. But I think the useful thing would be that when the two parties, I think the two parties may break up one which will form the right wing, which is the Republican Party, some people from joining right wing, and that's a potential because the economic disaster upon us, along with COVID, with intensified COVID is very significant. Uh, I don't agree Trump is most radical. I mean, Trump made those promises and I think Trump is, uh, was less militaristic. I, I agree with that. But on the other hand, he has increased the budget and he's backed uh, Israel in big ways. So, I mean, I, I think Trump may not, Trump is playing both sides. So I don't consider that. On uh, Sharon's comment, uniting with Democratic Party, uh, that's something to be debated. I think Roger is opposed to it and Sharon is for it. So that's it, I, I, I don't have a position on it. I cannot bring myself to vote for Biden right now. Uh, I do see the threat uh, Trump poses in white uh, supremacy and white nationalism for, for the country. So I do share with uh, Sharon's concern that there is this new, as this is being termed, neo-fascist versus neoliberal. This is uh, Colonel West and Chris Hedges both define it. I think they are kind of to the point. And uh, the differences should be observed and we should discuss it. But I, I don't have a subtle opinion on it, but I'm troubled by Trump, but I'm also troubled by Biden. And we don't have a third choice here. Folks, one of these few people is gonna be elected. So yes, in California, we're gonna vote. I probably will vote for peace and freedom and Gloria Lariva, that, but that doesn't solve the problem. We are discussing the evolution of politics in this crisis stage. And that's the point of discussing this party. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna actually jump uh, to a new, a person who hasn't spoken yet, and then Jean, and then Yusuf Norma, if you would uh, uh, unmute. Um, we don't know what Trump thinks. I mean, he lies. That's what he does. He goes to get elected. Uh, he could say he's against the war, which uh, Richard was advocating for for year about his can campaign four years ago. And I heard him. I heard Trump say that, and for a while I was declaring that Trump. But I not for long. Because it's evident, he just wants to get elected and he wants to get applause and he wants to get the throne. So any idea that he wants to do anything that we want done is uh, not, not even to be considered. Uh, much like the Democratic Party's uh, uh, 
relation to our work. Uh, as I put in the chat, you get the chance to vote for a socialist party. <laughs> Peace of Freedom Party <clears throat> has been on the ballot through the great endeavors of our people for the past 50 plus years keeping socialism actually on the ballot. Uh, and our Party for Socialism and Liberation has gotten on the ballot in many places where it's easier to get on the ballot and that's a good thing to do. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, the comment, I'm, I worry about opposing reform. So I kind of, every time there's a movement for change like this People's Party, I was going to look and thank you, Raj, for putting out all this information. Uh, it was done extremely informatively to me, so I don't have to go try to work it out myself. Um, about the People's Party, there's other thing, Kali Akuno is on uh, a, a, a more or less DSA presentation, and that's another organization I joined regardless that we know what we don't like about uh, DSA that's uh, like Green Party, it's for capitalism. <clears throat> Both of them, you know, wants to fix capitalism. Uh, I, I just want to fix our lives, uh, our control of our earth. Uh, anyway, I, I, I don't need to, I guess I don't need to worry about being opposed to reform when I'm opposing Interme intermediary or, or not working for intermediary efforts um, that have been pointed to. Thanks a lot. Okay. Um, next up is uh, Jean. Okay. Well, thank you. And I, I'm pleased the way the discussion is going. Um, but I wanted to, um, well, say that uh, back in the 1980s, when I was active uh, in the Peace and Freedom Party and ran as a candidate and all that, uh, I used to take my kids along with me to the Peace and Freedom Party. And in so doing, I effectively inoculated them against any participation in any political party. They've had it, basically. Uh, although they continue to vote, vote uh, pretty much the way I do in terms of uh, third parties. But, you know, my son um, made an interesting comment uh, on the Peace and Freedom Party saying, well, they're all very good at working together, but together they don't work very well. And I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what he meant by that. And uh, what, what the way I see it is that he, he's saying, you know, we, we have a sectarian system here the dominant two parties, and then sectarian parties who very organize very well inside their parties, but they can't organize with other parties. So there's this schism that inevitably de develops, not because these are not good people of good ideas and so forth. It's because it's a structural feature of American parties. Two dominant political parties, and then uh, a sectarian group that are all go always going to keep fighting each other. And I hope to see something different. But I'll just remind you that, uh, you know, the Sanders movement, contrary to what Chris Hedges may say, that is a movement. It got 13,000 votes more than any of these, uh, more than any of these other uh, sectarian parties, including the People's Party. So I just wanted to say that. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there, sorry. Okay, next up is uh, Yusuf. Anybody who wants to speak, go ahead and raise your hand. But uh, Yusuf, if you would uh, go uh, ahead. I'm unmuted, thank you. <laughs> well, I, I, I would disagree with uniting with the De uh, Democratic Party. I, I won't unite with any bourgeois party but uh, or I won't be in favor of uniting with any party. But uh, uh, getting out the vote for uh, the, the Democrats, uh, that is a uh, legitimate proposition. And I think, first of all, we should discuss two different issues. Who to vote in a particular election, uh, in a particular district, uh, uh, and 
uh, and then uh, the issue of building a, a movement, a, a, a movement uh, where uh, a, 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 a Marxists uh, will have a place, a voice, uh, uh, and will pu put pressure on elected officials and actually, uh, uh, in the end, actually be able to hold office. I think uh, the, the two issues are confused. I think the, what's most important uh, is, is building this movement. Uh, uh, and um, the trouble with uh, formation uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the social democratic formations, uh, including to a certain extent the, the Green Party, is that they uh, uh, they arise on the uh, agenda uh, only during uh, elections, scrambling for uh, uh, signatures, uh, debates on uh, who to vote for, and so on and so forth. <laughs> Most more important is what is to be done in between elections. Uh, uh, now, the, this election happens to be an important uh, election because I, I feel uh, that uh, uh, Trump is an existential threat, uh, uh, also an existential threat to the planet, even. Uh, so, I, so that's a, uh, this, this uh, election is important. But uh, uh, after the election, we have also to think what to do after the election, and that's to build a movement. Uh, so, the, so that's what I would uh, emphasize, and I don't think uh, uh, communists should actually unite with the bourgeois party. They may use it as a, the, uh, as a venue. They, uh, if they may vote for it, the United Front should be interpreted that way, but not actually uh, uniting and losing uh, uh, identity. Uh, I think that's uh, what I have to say. Thank you. Okay, next up is Orion and then Susan. So Orion, if you would unmute, go ahead and speak. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. You can hear me, huh? Yeah. Okay, uh, the, the icons, I don't even have a raise a hand. I don't know. And sometimes I write things and they don't work. Norma, that was wonderful. I loved Harris's comment, uh, Youssef. I disagree with the Democratic Party. Laura Wells is, is wonderful. I just wanted to add that, uh, and I, I was hoping Gigi would speak because she's an elector for the write-in campaign of the Jesse, Jesse Ventura, believe it or not. <laughs> and uh, I talked with staff last night on uh, their, uh, I mentioned it earlier, and I, uh, the Jesse Ventura's strategy that the top-down strategy is to have an interview on Joe Rogan with Trump, his old friend. So I, I was amazed that actually Trump is an old friend of hers. They're both in uh, wrestling, whatever. I think uh, Jesse was a wrestler and uh, Trump was an announcer and did all kinds of shenanigans. Trump is a racist, fascist motherfucker. That's Jimmy Dore. I hate to use that word. And Biden is a racist fascist motherfucker. These guys will say anything. Now they're talking about Trump is going to pardon. Oh, good strategy for Trump. They don't say good strategy for racist uh, uh, anti-socialist anti capitalist imperialist. Every time you say Trump, they, they talk about it like it's a fucking chess game or something. This is life and death. Biden is horrible person. These people are the representatives of the ruling class. We have, to, we have to change the conversation. Too much shit about, oh, will Trump do this on that goddamn crystal balls show? Oh, is Trump gonna do this? Is Biden gonna do this? This is fucking circus, this, but it's a murderous circus. Palestine is dying in open air prison. Uh, you know, you guys know, you people, hate to say guys, you people know all this crap that's going on and we have to change the conversation. It's all this bullshit about this icon, about the other, the DNC pick. Uh, it, we have to have a class hatred, and baby, you better believe I got class hatred, and I have class love. 
and we can work with other people, but they will try to stop us every time we try to do anything. I don't know about DSA. I know Gerald's working with that. And, uh, you know, I talked to him as I, I got 3000 members now. So we got to infiltrate everything and we got to be nice and pretty and everything. But we got to have that class hatred down deep in our roots. We understand. We understand what needs to be done. We do not have a Marxist Leninist party. I, I, I told the guy, the, this young staffer that cut his teeth on the Occupy and he's, he's talking about how great Jason, Jesse Ventura is and Cynthia McKenna. And I said, you need to read State Power. State Power by Lenin. Understand the goddamn system. Understand the capitalist imperialist system. It is too much ignorance, Black Lives Matter, uh, multiracial, um, uh, uh, multiracial, uh, I call it the uh, multiracial rebellion of millions. We have to win them over. And we can't be arrogant. Harris is so, so right. No ultra leftism. And we have to infiltrate everybody. We have to get in the People's Party. They threw me out. And uh, it's in the chat. They threw out the Julian Assange channel. But we got to keep trying. So anyway, power to the working class, the international work working class, and its allies. And we must destroy the ruling class. And all this bullshit about, and then the RCP, they're saying uh, revolution, nothing less. Well, I think they're probably ultra leftists, but I don't know. Maybe they, maybe they are gonna be the new Lenis, Marxist Leninist party. Thank you, thank you. And I have, okay, um, next, I'm so glad next. that I've expressed this. Next up is uh, Susan. I've asked you to unmute. If you would unmute yourself. Looks like I did. I have to close the door. We can, we can hear you. We can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. So I have I have a I have a few thoughts. Uh, first, Yusuf, thank you for your remarks. Um, Susan, are you there? To Kaliakuna, I'll talk with people on a eco-socialist system change, not climate change program, which was very, very good. And I suggest that people check out uh, Cooperation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi for broad program um, and lots of activities going on with uh, cooperative economics. Um, I am wondering if the Electoral College has come up in this discussion. Could someone let me know? Yes, yes it did. It yes, did. It did. OK. So I just want to say that I know so many people and organizations who live in, in uh, blue states who are working in swing states to influence this election. And a lot of their work is has preceded this election and will go we lost her. I don't hear her. I don't know if that, that's come up about what I guess some people can you call say a what, state strategy. Can you say what community. you were saying? We missed it. We missed what you were just saying. Last 60 seconds. Okay, well, my question is addressed. Is, I'm very interested in the debate within the Green Party, of which I am a member, about uh, how to approach this election. And Laura wrote something that I thought was sensible, and I don't know if she presented it earlier because I came in. Okay. We have a bad connection, I think, with her. Um, yeah. Let's see. And you're coming in and out about how to approach. I'm sorry. Um, Your connection is bad. I see that. I'll turn the video off. So, Laura. Oh, I'm put the video on. Okay, <laughs> uh, Laura. Could you um, say more? If did you did you speak to this before? This today. Uh, right now, I mean, this program. Not today. I mean, other than in the chat. Okay. 
So I'd like to find out, well, I, I missed the part about the People's Party largely, and I'm sorry. So who, who would be best to connect? Did, was there a presentation? Yes. Who made it? I did. Oh, much. maybe Raj, I can talk to you on the phone. Sure. Okay, so Laura, could you address debates in the Green Party or among Greens? Okay, is it, is it my turn next, Alan? Yeah, go ahead, Laura, yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, so I sent out a blog called Stop Trump and Pressure for What You Really Want. And I got a lot of responses in all directions, some of them saying, uh, you know, not having read it accurately, but some of them said, how can you possibly tell anybody to vote for Biden? And I wasn't. I was trying to talk to the people who are very afraid of Trump, especially people in California who really want Trump to go. And I've learned, I've heard enough about sometimes in other countries where the, say Brazil, you know, where uh, a, not even a neo-fascist, but a fascist gets elected, um, or in Argentina, you know, because two more aligned groups do, cannot get together, and they don't obviously have ranked choice voting. Um, and so then that split vote happens and the fascist comes in. And so people are concerned about that and there is some legitimacy to that concern. So I was just saying um, the simple thing, which is not Green Party policy, uh, but the simple thing of watch the polls and no matter what state you're in, if the spread is 15, 20 points, you know, as uh, Hillary Clinton uh, beat Donald Trump in California by 30, 40, 40 million votes. And she got like 62% and he got 32%. Okay. There was, no, no, but in terms of the machine, rather. There was a lot of room in there for people to vote for peace and freedom or green and say, this is what I really want, you know, out of those, you know, umpty um, million, I'm not sure what it was. I, I'm sure about the 30 point spread. I'm not sure about the actual number of votes. Um, but they, so just trying to say, your vote will go for Biden in California. Vote for what you really want. And you know, my focus is green because I, it go, it's a national thing, but vote for peace and freedom or vote for the Green Party. But people are so, uh, programmed and propagandized into voting against what they don't want, as has been said during this, um, during this time. They, that is all they can think. You know, so I was just trying to open it up a little bit. You know, go for what you want as well as against what you don't want. Stop Trump and pressure for what you do want. Over. Okay, why don't we uh, go ahead and um, open this up. People can uh, just chime in and we can have our group discussion starting out. Does that sound okay to people? Yeah, I, I want to, yeah, that's fine with me. Go ahead, I jump want in. to go first. Uh, I wanted to say that Gene's being a little unfair to Chris Hedges. Chris Hedges actually supported Bernie Sanders in 16, okay? And then Ber when Bernie actually supported Hillary Clinton did not put up a fight with with uh, his his own delegates. That's when he turned against Bernie Sanders. Now Chris Hedges is an anarchist in his thinking, and I'm a Marxist, so I'm not for Chris Hedges. But what Chris Hedges does is very succinctly describes the crisis that is upon us. He does a very good job. That's what he has done here. And Jimmy Dore is also is a very sharp in terms of he's from a working class and he is very honestly showing. Both of them display what is going on. Now, my thinking is that there is American working class for some reason. And I, and I want to thank uh, Laura Wells for putting in the chat room that 
uh, Green Party is the third largest, 250,000 plus members. But what I'm saying is here, this People's Party has a potential of growth because it's a reformist party and American people are not yet ready to move in a more radical direction. So it is gonna draw a lot of people, whether we like it or not. As a Marxist, I would like them to be coming to Marxist party. I would prefer any of the communist party that are existing over any other party. And the next best would be uh, Green Party for me. So, but the point is that American people have been propagandized so much and they still have the illusions that somehow what was in the past can be, we can go back to the past. So, and Trump is a reactionary. I mean, really this is a reactionary reaction to what people's forward movement want, equality for women, gays, uh, poor people having more things. This, this is progress, progress of history, right? And Trump represent a reaction, whereas Biden and DNC represent a, a kind of hoodwinking of the same people, whereas they are dishonest. At least Trump is not dishonest, okay, in that sense. He's dishonest in many ways, but he's saying uh, that he, the jobs are for white working class and everybody else just put up with it, uh, that kind of stuff. And so both are bad. I, uh, the point is, here is a formation that is coming up highly conflicted. And I have a feeling this will grow because dissatisfaction in the Democratic Party will, will not move towards unless we find that Green Party or Peace and Freedom or any other communist party is able to articulate the moment we are living in better than these people. This is Gary Hicks speaking. Can yeah, uh, actually, this is all uh, open right now. Maybe yeah, Gary hasn't said Gary's anything. Like Gary. Gary's talking. Yes. Gary's talking. Hi. First of all, I read the, I read the, I was reading carefully the uh, People's Party uh, thing when it was put up on the screen, okay? And the thing that struck me very profoundly about that, that entire document is that the first, the absolute first line of that document talks about addressing the three evils of militarism, racism, and exploitation without mentioning once that, this, that these were attributed to a democratic socialist named Martin Luther King Jr. And all the rest of that document in one way or another, militates exactly against what Dr. King was all, all, all about. I mean, that's, 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 that's point one. Point two, I'm going to, I, I'm going to vote for Joe Biden. I don't like the guy. I think he's, you know, I think he's sleepy. I think he's whatever, whatever all the things are, okay? I view the Democratic Party as a battering ram against the fascist Republican Party. And if we don't see it as this, and if we don't look at it as this, we're going to have four years of hell to pay, period. You don't need, we, I mean, we don't need to argue about this, that, or the other thing about the Democrats. I mean, the thing is we are going to have hell to pay if Trump gets another four years in. And the Democrats, are, the Democrats are somewhat sneaky about it, about, about what they do. But we know they're sneaky and we know we can, we, 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 we even often know how they sneak around and we can actually fight them in certain dark alleys. But if we do not, if we do not defeat Donald Trump in this, in, in this election, we are going to have hell to pay in terms of you know, the, the, the goings on and the continued growth of a fascist social order. Gary, your, your vote has, your Jean, vote has been, no Jean, effect, you're waiting to be called Gary. on. Jean, you're, hold, Norma, hold on. Jean is waiting to be called Gary. on. Jean, Jean, if you want to Jean would like to respond. Go ahead. 
Go ahead. On, about uh, Chris Hedge, Hedge's attacks on Bernie. Look at what Bernie did. Chris Hedges accuses him of being dishonest and capitulating to Hillary Clinton. However, if you examine, this is what Bernie said he would do throughout his campaign. He said that he would not form a third party, he would not endorse a third party, and that he would endorse whoever the Democratic Party uh, 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 nominated. That's what he said he would do. That's what he did. He is an honorable man. And for Chris Hedges to claim otherwise says something about Chris Hedges, not Bernie. And also remind you that again, 13 million votes went to Bernie. So that's, and he began a movement. So let's just be clear about that and not fall into this uh, uh, sheepdog nonsense that uh, Chris Hedges promulgates. And also note, I put something in the uh, chat about a history of third parties, uh, history of labor parties in the US going back to the workers party, uh, the, lab the workers party of the 1830s. So uh, that's informative, urge people to consult with it. I'm gonna turn off the uh, recording now. So if people wanna just uh, jump in, go ahead and jump in. Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library receives no corporate funding, nor do we have any paid staff. We rely on the support of working class folks that share our commitment to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat at our in-person forums, Please send contributions to our treasurer, either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday, S-U-N-D-A-Y, at yahoo.com. And the name is Richard Fallenbaum. And checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California, 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F-A-L-L-E-N-B-A-U-M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Nebro Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue, Oakland, California, 94609 or directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml. Info for information, write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org. And the website is marxistlibr.org. Thank you.